Madhouse Podcasting Network. All right, what is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to the Mindless Four Podcast. Today with us, a very special guest, referred to us by our good friend Scott Dieterman. This is Mike from Rib Effects. Uh, from what up? you can, from what you can see in the background, obviously he does phenomenal work, man. Uh, how long have you been doing effects, man? Well, I'd say I probably started from a pretty young age. I mean, just like most anybody that I think is in this field, it's it's a really um, I think most people that are in this field got started in a real DIY type scenario. You know, you watch, you see these movies growing up in the eighties, um, no internet. I, I, you know, it's like, well, how do you make this stuff? Yeah. You know, so you have magazines that you look at, you have things like that and you just kind of do it, you know, and I'm lucky that, you know, I had very supportive parents, you know, my father's a contractor, so he makes things with his hands, was very supportive of me. Right. My mom was always, she never, they never, the kind of movies like the for better or for worse really i mean i, I probably saw some movies that i <laughs> definitely should have not seen done that <laughs> in that time period which is i'm still processing you know right. in my 40s so uh but but um that's pretty much it i mean it's it's really been a lifelong pursuit you know it's really it ties into a lot of things you know when i was a kid i loved magic you know um movie you know movie magic right you know sleight of hand magic these things like kind of tricking people you yeah. know that kind of stuff and um and so that was it's been pretty much a lifelong passion for me you know professionally i've been doing it maybe now for uh for maybe 15 years nice you know about yeah. that long because so, you know when you watch a horror movie off here and there you watch a horror movie and and you know my favorite thing is in horror movies especially when you watch a lot of those 80s films uh especially john carpenter i'm a huge fan of practical uh hardcore yeah. effects like that you know where it, it's it, it's yeah. something that the actors actually saw it wasn't in post-production of cgi i mean if you have a really good company that can produce really good cgi then it looks good but i'm more of a practical fan hands down like the thing one of my all-time oh, favorite 100%. films you know what i mean well for, for me a, f a film is done in camera yeah so what's the camera sees that's the film when you start getting the CGI, this is just my personal opinion, and you know, I don't want to offend anybody, but the, like for me, when you start getting the CGI, that's more of like a cartoon to me. Right. For me, film is what is in the camera. What is the camera seeing? And I'm yeah. seeing what is in the camera. You know, we were talking about music earlier. It's like a true fidelity of like, here's what you're seeing in the camera, and this is what the what the what you know the the moviegoer is going to see. Right. And that's to me what makes a movie a, a film a film. Yeah, yeah. exactly. No, I 100% I agree because. It's rare that you see a lot of these movies today, especially horror, that actually will go and use practical effects. You know, a lot of the things it's easy just to put in the CGI and just kind of do it. Um, one of the more recent films that was heavy on practical effects, which I was very happy about, was that Blumhouse film Freaky uh, with Vince Vaughn and uh, Catherine Newton. Um, the deaths in that film were just... I think I saw that one. Yeah, they were, they were so... You know, there was a little mix, just like a little bit of CGI, but for the most part, it was practical. And a lot of the deaths were just pretty brutal. And I was like, I'm glad they went a practical approach because now I can see it on screen and it looks it looks better to me. You know what I mean? Well, I think that, you know, well, th that it, it presents a lot of, and, you know, I don't work in the film business, but it does right. present different um, challenges when you're doing things practically because you have to figure out how to actually do something on that, on any particular given day so it's like well wow. how do we make this dragon okay so you have to pre-plan or you know how do we make this dead body there's pre-planning that's involved and you have to you know figure out the shot and so on and so forth and so it requires a lot more um ahead of time planning so i think the movie that you get at the end of the day is more true of a consistent vision of what the director wanted right whereas i think in the, like the more of the cgi world you are more dealing with um oh we'll fix it in post or you know, that we'll do this later, you know, and it's sort of a mishmash kind of thing. And I think that right. that's, at least for me personally, it's like, I feel disconnected to a lot of like the big effects movies, you know, like the Marvel movies and things like right. that, which they're good movies and, and, you know, they have their audience and everything. But for me, they just are not as impactful for me when I saw, and obviously I'm jaded to some degree because I'm older, but I, I still like try to maintain like some like excitement for haunted houses for, um film because i still tap into that kid in me you know right. and it's like i haven't seen anything 
you know, in CGI that was so crazy, like uh, and an experience that I had when I saw American Werewolf in London, for instance. Oh, you know God. what I mean? Yes. I never had that. Like, what is happening? Right? I just can't. My mind can't even perceive what is happening on the screen. When you're a kid and watching that, you just your mind is blown. I mean, for you know, for lack of a better term, your mind is blown because you you know. And for me, it was a constant pursuit of trying to figure out how did they do that. Right. Yeah. You know? The big question somebody is had, somebody how, had to yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I mean, I, I grew up in Los Angeles and, and Southern California, so it's like I know that movies are made here and that like right. human beings make them. So I mean, they have to do it somehow. Exactly, <laughs> and so, and it's funny you bring uh, up American Werewolf in London. That's one of like, I think it's one of the f- like first films as far as werewolves go that actually showed the transformation process of like him, his limbs extending out and everything, and that was unseen from that time. You know, now it's like. It, you could do it no problem, but when that movie came out, that was well, you had different, you know. Yeah, you had different like transformations, but yeah, it was never like the the body horror of it. I guess yeah, it was never like that. You know, you had the old earlier, um, you know, where they just used different gels and lights and different color makeup and black yeah. and white to you know do like a Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing, or you know, just cut you know they cut up pieces and like montage, and you see the prosthetic kind of build right. up on a face. Um, or the makeup builds up on a face, but uh, yeah, that I mean, seeing that because it just and the way it was kind of was beautifully directed as well right. by John Landis. So, you know, the the effects and, and and the direction and the editing of you know it just was so seamless, you know. Right. So though those are that that's the thing. Those those are things that excite me when I have a sense of wonder of how how did they make that, yeah. you know? Or and, and you're just so lost in it when. Um, you know, when you watch a CGI movie, I just don't have that as much because I know it's like, okay, yeah. well, you can pretty much do anything you want. Yeah. And so, and, and that's the other thing. It's the way these movies are constructed from the beginning, like plot and everything. If you're making it practically, you have to consider all that, you know? Yeah. And I think it, to me, I, as an artist, you know, I hate to use the term as I'm an artist, but as an artist, you do work better, I think, or con- I, at least myself, under constraint a little bit. Because then you start thinking like you have a more focused vision and you start thinking with this limited set of tools to yeah. have, what can I make? You know, and that's much exactly. more exciting for me than we can make the earth explode anytime we want. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, no doubt, man. So let's jump into the to the very beginning, man, for Rib Effects. Uh, when did you start the company and, and what just drove you to finally go, fuck it, I'm going to do it? Well, we're a brand new company. So this year, pretty much, I'm considering my soft open year for, right. for the business. Um, I've basically just taken work with clients I know, clients I trust, and and um, basically, I'm trying to organically grow the business. Right. And I uh, didn't do any trade shows. Obviously, this year was a weird year. You know, our, the, the trade show for our business, which is um, the Halloween and Attractions Expo in St. Louis, right. um, was uh, held... Um, in a later date this year, I think it was in May, which usually is in March. And, you know, most uh, people in my business, they take their, all their orders in for the, for that year at that trade show. And then, you know, fulfill them throughout the year. Yeah. And so having a later date like that and, you know, being a newer company, you know, I, um, I didn't want to take that risk. I just wanted to sort of grow, get all, get my feet under me and um, grow naturally. And the next year I have a relatively large booth, I guess, for, you know, beginner business, but, right. uh, relatively large booth at the trade show. And I think that that's really when it's going to, um, to exponentially grow at that point, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, so for those who don't know, tell them what your, uh, your, what is your like specialty as far as the effects go? Like, do you, are you creating a lot for haunts? Are you creating a lot for like, what are you creating for? For people that don't know? For me, it's, it, for me, predominantly it's the haunted attraction business because right. that's the business I love. Um, and uh, it's the business I have the most experience in. And I think there's an immediacy to it where, you know, let's say, for instance, if I'm doing stuff for film, which I've done, but it's, you know, it's sort of, you don't get a real, you don't really have a payoff for it unless you get a really cool shot of it in the movie or something. You know, a lot of that stuff right. is on the cutting room floor. But I love, first of all, number one, I just love haunted houses. I've loved them my entire life, you know, and um, I like making something and then being able to go out and see it. You know, see people interact with it, see people like literally scared of it in real time. And that's really, really rewarding. Um, and uh, that's who I predominantly cater to other like interactive experiences like escape games, um, you know, things like that interactive uh, theatrical experiences, which, right. you know, um, are really cool as well, which I love. You know, I love hands on tactile experiences. So mainly that's um, 
what I do. And my specialty, to, to tie into that, my specialty is really cinematic, ultra-realistic uh, props that, you know, I mean, people are, you know, back in the day, you could probably get away with a bowl of spaghetti and grapes for eyeballs, you know what I mean? Right. It's like, nowadays, the customer is much more savvy with what they want to see in a haunted house. And um, it's trying to live up to a cinematic standard and uh, the most realism I can possibly get out of a prop. And uh, and that would be my specialty. Yeah, I mean, you know, I go, I've been going to haunts now since, shoo, 2008. Uh, and, you know, it, one of my favorite things, it, like you said, a lot of people like to see the, the you know, the gore and, you know, a lot of this stuff. I, I just love seeing, I'm a, I'm a huge guy. I'm a huge fan of just scenic work. You know what I mean? I love seeing mm. everything go and, and, you know, props and, and makeup and, and whatnot. So, uh, seeing stuff like this, you know, it, you know, when I go to conventions and whatnot, I'm just, I'm blown away by it. Like the, the fact that some people can, can do what you do, uh, just amazes me because this is something like, like you said earlier too, this is an art. This is, you know, a lot of Halloween fans out there love this stuff and they, and they'll consider this, even myself consider this an art. This is a, a great art form mm -hmm. that is a uh, more for, you know, a, a much more mature audience, but it, it is a great art. You know what I mean? You know, I agree. Um, it is for a mature audience, but I would say that, you know, personally, and I'm not a huge, I mean, I, I do gore relatively well, I would say, but <laughs> ultimately, you know, my, um, I'm not, I love monsters, I love fantasy and sci-fi, those are sort of, um, you know, the things that, that excite me the most, and I think with Rib Effects, um, that is something that I want to bring more into the haunted attraction business because everything where there is gore, you know, amongst us, that is sort of the more, the low, you know, you could, anybody could do gore, but could you do something really cool, very yeah. engaging that has a story? And those are the things that I like, as far as like the best haunted houses I've ever been to, they all have that sense of suspension of disbelief. Yeah. And that ties into, you know, we're talking about scenic work and everything like that. It's like, once I step through the threshold of your property, I want to not be in the in the regular world anymore. I'm yeah. now transported into whatever the the visionary's hands, whoever I'm in, the, the person doing the the director of the haunted house, or what have you, movie, right. the novelist, whatever it is. It's all about suspension of dis disbelief. And so my part in it, you know, with the props and everything, is to be able to support that. Right. You know, so. If, you build, make all this time doing a great scenic job, and then you've got some, you know, like a man, you know, mannequin dummy in the background. Well, not so hot because now all the time that was spent on that scenic work by those artists is now undermined by my faulty prop work. <laughs> right. You know, so they all have to be. They all have to go in. They all have to uh, mingle together, and that's another cool aspect of um, of working in the haunted house business because it's a lot like I was talking to you earlier. Uh, before we're recording that i've been in bands most of my life i love that collaborative nature of it where it's like and it's almost kind of like the circus in a weird yeah. way just, you know it's like this thing that comes and then goes it's like in the town and then gone, <laughs> yeah, you know? exactly and i kind of love that and it, and it requires you to all work together to all these specialists in your art you know filmmaking is like that to some degree so it's not as you know punk rock or whatever as like being in a haunted house but yeah um but uh, i love all that yeah, you know, I, uh, that's, that's what I love. One of my favorite things too, uh, and I've seen it at past events, is, is mixing the world of, of, of heavy metal and, and punk with, with horror. Um, mm. It's all, it's one of my all time things, just to mix that mu that music world with with the, the horror world, because you know those two, uh, you know we, we're talking about music, we're talking about you know effects and whatnot. I've seen some great stuff come out of uh, some amazing talented bands that I had just idolize uh in mazes for example at halloween horror nights back in like 2013 they did a black sabbath maze you know what i mean and for those who know black sabbath oh, yeah. music mm -hmm. you know it's just it's second to none and to, to see mm. that music world come to life you know the songs of black sabbath come to life it was just a beautiful beautiful uh challenge that was approached by john murdy that he executed perfectly uh on the the note of challenges. What do you find the most challenging thing when when designing uh, like a new a new prop or something? Well, I think the most challenging thing is is figuring out um, basically tempering your ego. Right. You know, you can have like the really, <laughs> you know, you you can really have like, oh man, I have the best idea for this monster, you know. But 
you really have to think, you have to say it's, you know, it's about you and your artwork and, and your abilities, uh, you know, wh what you can do, but it's also, you're there to support uh, the haunted house owner ultimately, right. you know, and their vision. So I have a vision and an aesthetic. And if a haunted owner comes to me and wants to work with me, they obviously already like the aesthetic and vision. So what can I do? That's not just about me and what I want to do, but what, it, what can I do to support the person that's putting the entire show together? Right. And that's a difficult dance sometimes, you know, it's like, it's not always easy, you know, but yeah. I think, um, I have, I have so much respect and love for this business mm -hmm. and the people that are in the business. I mean, that's, that's another thing. I love the people that are in this business, all the haunted house owners across the country and people that work in there and everything. So, uh, that it, it is, it's not as hard as probably as if you're working with, um, you know, in, in, in Hollywood and you've got, you know, film executives and producers and things like that. Right. Whereas here it's a little more, like I say, it's like the circus. So you're all kind of going at it together, you yeah. know, and it's, a, it's that. But it, that, that's probably the most complicated thing is everything else is just kind of comes naturally if I was just to make whatever I want to make. But it's really trying to make the coolest thing that I can, but also something that people are actually going to want to use in their, in their haunted right. house. You know, yeah. can't be too esoteric or whatever, you know, ever like, oh, you don't get that reference of this, you know, Z grade movie that no one saw, you know, you don't get that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, okay, no, I mean, it's not really for that. It's about, you know, a big holistic experience. And so yeah. that, that to me is the toughest aspect. No, I, I'm a, like I said, I, I really pay attention in, in mazes and, and wherever I go to with these events uh, of just props and stuff because uh, I am a fan of looking out for Easter eggs. I, I do like to see the details and work done. Um, you're actually, it's funny because you're actually our first like FX artist onto the, onto the scene uh, on the podcast today. So that's a big plus for us because I've been really wanting to dive deep behind the scenes of haunts and stuff. So it's really cool to, to really be talking to you about this kind of stuff because, uh, you know, not a lot of people realize that a lot of the stuff they probably see in those mazes are going to be coming from you, from the, you know, companies like you and stuff that, that put all these together. And there's a whole process of doing it. Uh, speak to us about uh, time-wise process of, of, of uh, like, from a small sculpture to, like, something huge. What does it take to, to get these complete? You know that that there's so many variables involved with that. Yeah. You know, depending on what the end what the end goal is going to be, you know, because in this, it the the thing I guess also that separates like this kind of effects work from a film, it's the budgets are much much smaller. Right. So and you're also you're you know I mean I am creating these custom pieces, but these are also a commodity product that is being bought and sold on the market, you know, which is the trade show or whatever, you know, so. That is another aspect as well. So there is profit to be made from right. from the selling aspect, you know, um, and covering costs and everything. So it, all of that goes into figuring out like how much time, materials, what kind of mold making and everything. It can be relatively quick. It can take a long time. You know, it just it really depends on what that end, um, what the end use of the product is going to be. I guess that's, I would say that that's another the most another difficult aspect of this business but it's something i enjoy it's like you know this is it's half artistry and special effects and half like production you know right. like production line kind of work and so you almost have to be you have to take whatever your idea is you have to scale it down you have to figure out all the ways you can take away but still maintain the essence still maintain the you know the coolness of the piece right but also you know be able to pay your bills yeah no uh yeah that's the biggest thing too is yeah i i could see that right there is always trying to make your you know your profit on top of you know what you're selling for that way you you know your business keeps going and you can keep you know yeah. you can survive and whatnot i get that 100 percent uh you know and and so that 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 really dictates on how much time i mean and and you know, generally speaking i mean you can sculpt something yeah, you sculpt the head, takes a couple days, three days to sculpt the head, takes right. a couple days to mold it. You know, I mean, these are, you know, just basically it could be something like that. But, you know, over time, you get pretty, I get, you can get pretty quick with doing some of this stuff, you right. know, because you're, it's almost like a it's repetition. Like, I try to, it's repetition. You yeah. know what I mean? And that's another cool aspect of this business. It's like you really become good at what you're doing because you're not just going, from a film set doing a little thing here and there it's like you are constantly working if you're casting something you're casting 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 right you're painting 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 hundreds at a time hundred at a time you know and it's it's kind of non-stop you know so yeah 
I mean, that aspect is, is pretty cool too as well. You get kind of good at, at streamlining things, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm seeing these two in the back of you right here and I, I'm just, I'm so blown away of how amazing they look, man. I mean, just seeing those, if I could see those in person, they probably look, there's probably way more details <laughs> that I'm missing. That's not on camera, but just look, oh, yeah, yeah. these I are beautiful right really here. Man. Crappy lighting on it, but oh, thanks man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these are a couple, um, you know, this is like a staked vampire kind of guy it can be on the, you know, you can mount it on a wall, like you stake them to the wall or can right. lay on the ground. This is sort of a, a C, what I call like a sea hag character. Um, you know, I kind of, I'm a huge Lovecraft fan, right? Which, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are out there in podcast land, but uh, this is sort of more inspired by Lovecraft and right. kind of, you know, I want to bring some of those elements. It's just kind of cooler, you know, fantasy horror elements maybe yeah. that uh, are not out, out there in the, the prop marketplace with haunted houses. So now what is the absolute, uh, cause I, I imagine just, you know, looking at the finished result and, and you just always, you have to be like when you see your foot, your finished product, you just kind of have to stare at it for a little bit and just be proud of it. Like, what is your, like, what, what is it that like when you, when you finish something and you kind of just look at it, you're just like, damn, like, like that looks fun. I, I can't believe I did that. Um, that usually comes later. Yeah. Uh, when I, um, you know, when you see it in, in, in the haunted house or something, I think one thing, I think that hampers a lot of people. Like if I was going to give advice to somebody wanting to get into like an artistic field, I would say, don't be too precious with your, with your work. Right. You know, don't, don't, you know, don't think about, actually don't think about it too much. Right. Like the end goal, you know, like, oh, wow, this is some great masterpiece, you know, it's like, yeah. okay, that's done. Move on to the next thing and just keep moving. Cause otherwise then you're going to, you're just going to be in this world, in this bubble in your head that is, um, it's unhealthy to some degree and it doesn't right. really, uh, promote, uh, working, like keep, keeping working, keeping yourself moving, to, moving and progressing, you know what I mean? So it's, I try not to do that. You know, right. I try to go, okay, does this look good? Now, is this something that I'm proud of to, to leave the shop? That, that is something, you know, so quality and, and a stand, I have a certain standard right. of which I like to, to, to have my products be, but I don't look at it and go, wow. So, well, what I do uh, get proud of is when I learn like a new technique or a new like molding process or use a different material or um, those kind of things, because I still get that same, you know, feeling when I first learned how to, you know, make a mask or, you know, back, you know, make a stone mold and, you know, do a latex mask, those kind of things. Right. There's a certain sense of like achievement with that, that I really, really enjoy. Right. You know, but when I think about the, you know, the piece in terms of like its artistic value or whatever, product, I don't really, I try not to do that. Right. You know? Yeah, no, I feel you. I'm the same. I'm actually the same way with podcasts. It's like, I, I'm like, that was a really good podcast, but how can I top that one? You know what I mean? Like, how can always I always be better? Yeah. How can it always be better? How can I always get like, how, how can I get people to come back to see the next? It's like, you know, I, I'm a huge, like I said, we, we were talking about films. I'm a huge Quentin Tarantino fan. Um, mm. And that was the one thing he said after Pulp Fiction. Everyone kept telling him, how are you going to top this next film? And then he did Jackie Brown, which in my opinion, was another my great favorite. film. Yeah, great film. Yeah, that's I my love. favorite Tarantino film. Yeah, yeah, Jackie Brown is, it was a great film, great soundtrack, great cast. Um, so th I think that's always the, big, the biggest challenge in the industry. What It doesn't matter what industry you're in. It's always, how are you going to keep it going to, to bring people back to, oh, that was cool, or, oh, I, I like that, and, oh, I, I can't wait to see that. You know, it's like you want to you keep bringing people back, like, what's new from them now? Like, what can I expect? Like I've seen their stuff in the past and it's amazing. What did they do new now that I, that I can enjoy even more? Yeah. 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 Just keep moving, you know, and that, that all the artists or, you know, musicians, filmmakers, you know, whatever, the ones that I respect the most, they keep moving. And that, you know, sometimes they put out some stinkers because yeah. it's like they kept moving, you know, but you got to take that risk. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that you can really do cool stuff unless you put yourself out there. And I think if you think too much about, you know, what are people going to think, or does this thing is a masterpiece or whatever, or this is, a, I, I don't, I don't know if it really, the, the, those kind of thoughts really help you in moving other than, you know, you just, everything is just one continual f process and one continual flow. Right. Uh, yeah. What is your absolute favorite part about doing this? Like the FX and everything, like what's your absolute favorite part of it about it? Uh, it's hard to say. I would probably say painting, I think, is, yeah. is my favorite thing to do is painting the pieces. I think because that's when you can really see them come to life. 
right you know and to see to see something that was once a sculpture and now like was then liquid you know essentially yeah. Yeah. you know and now it's solidified to this thing and then you're painting it and you're looking at it and it's just before your eyes kind of coming to life and that yeah. is a really cool uh, cool thing that i i enjoy almost every time i do it really yeah. you know what i mean even I feel like even uh, the most like mundane dr frankenstein thing. bringing the the creature to life <laughs> yeah kind of yeah yeah, yeah, yeah in a way yeah. yeah i mean i like it it's cool it's just like wow okay this is a thing now yeah you know what i mean it's like this is a thing it's like this is going to be a cool character you know yeah no definitely so. and, and that's it's cool to as a fan perspective, it's always cool to see the end result inside the mazes and whatnot because, you know, you get to look at these props and, you know, whatever. If it's a, you know, uh, speaking on like knots and, and horn nights and stuff, if you go through these mazes and you really like them and then, you you know, you go keep going through them and, you you know, if you go multiple nights and you see more and you start discovering more props you didn't get to see the first time and stuff and then you, something catches your eye. And, I mean, there's so many things yeah. that I've, you know, over the years I've gone to all these haunts and there's just so many props and stuff that I'm just like, wow, that was phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, no, I know. And I mean, yeah. you know, it's great because the people that actually make the movies, yeah. you know, the effects artists, the, the the crafts people that make these movies, you know, these movies aren't made by, you know, the movie isn't entirely made by Quentin Tarantino. You right. Know? I mean, there's like, you know, it, it, it is a series of crafts people mm -hmm. that are coming together under the direction of a director, but everybody with their own, you know, ideas, thoughts. Right loves hates or whatever and come together and you know they're they're like us they're fans yeah you know? it's like, yeah nobody gets into like making effects for movies and goes i hate movies i don't watch them you yeah know? it's like no they're fans of movies yeah you know? like tarantino's a good example because he you know he puts that kind of stuff in his movie but any easter eggs and things like that but yeah. you know that all the people that work on the films you know there's you're gonna see that that a little bit of things shine through you know right yeah now, uh, earlier we were, you know, we've been talking a little bit about music and stuff. Is there, uh, are you a big fan of, of, of having music go on while you're, while you're working? Does that help you motivate you to keep getting things done or are you just kind of like a silence guy? No, uh, I like to listen to like podcasts and, um, things like that when I work. Okay. Uh, I don't like to listen to music too much. It's too distracting for me right. because I love music. So music, you know, we're, I don't know if we were talking earlier, but music is really my one of my biggest passions in my life right. so when i listen to music i i sit down and listen i'm i don't even like listening to music in the car really right. like i like to sit down and listen to the music because it, it engages me you know i'm engaged so yeah. if i'm engaged otherwise like I, I like listening to just people talking in the background you know that's if, when i'm working that's more my speed you know some people work i mean like at, a, at an old shop that i worked at you like to play like edm music like really loud you right. know i don't know if that was some kind of like you know, modern day Henry Ford production line, like, <laughs> you know, the workers are worked yeah. to the beat, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know, but you know, it's like, that's cool. And that works for some people. So yeah. Personally for me, it, you know, I mean, I, I don't, at that point I just kind of tune it out. Yeah, no, I'm the same way. I'm a cross between music and podcast, you know, I mean, I just, I like to listen to something while, I, while you, if I'm even editing like some videos or you know, waiting for something to, to, to work on something or like if I'm having to create like a logo for like Photoshop or something, I'll just throw on like a music or a podcast to just keep me going. Um, and it motivates me. Uh, that's one of my things too. It's one of my traditions. Every time I go to a haunt, I like blast a lot of metal and, and punk music cause it just gets me in the mood. I'm, I'm a huge uh, fan of uh, the misfits. So, um, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of their music relates to Halloween. So it's just something I always, and oh, I play yeah. year round. So it's like, it's never stopped. One of the great, uh, one of the great haunted houses out there uh, is a haunted house called Statesville in um, Chicago or yeah. outside of Chicago. But it's, it's run by a really good team called zombie army. And, um, and uh, before each show, they have this thing called the pit. So oh. they get all the actors. And I was lucky enough to be up in the rafters when they were doing the pit and they were doing the announcements, but they, all the actors, everybody gets together in this big communal area. It's pitch dark. The director of the show, uh, this guy John Laflamboy, he's in costume as this like nice. you know kind of Mad Max looking prison guard, yeah. and he gets out there and he pumps up the crowd and everybody's in character and they play this you know kind of you know heavy beat music and everybody's just the whole crowd's kind of moving up and oh, down dude. and and just they're shouting and ramping up and then boom you send you send them out to the crowd you know that's, that's so that's cool awesome yeah yeah that's really cool really cool thing to see you know very lucky to to see it in person. And um, it was really cool, and I love that. I love that. You know, if you're going to do something like that, for sure. Yeah. yeah. 
Now that's that's my th I think that's my thing is uh, dri when driving out to the haunts, I love to just blast music. Uh, I, you know, I got some Iron Maiden on the playlist, some Ronnie James Dio, uh, Megadeth, Metallica, Misfits. You know, a bunch of different. It's a genre of thing. I, I mean, I listen to like just about everything. You know what I mean? And uh, Johnny Cash. You know, that's uh, I know that's a random sure. word, but you know, Cash is just it, it's, no, yeah. Um, so I just, I, I just turn it on and, and just get myself pumped up and then, you know, just waiting at the front gate while you're waiting for the haunt to start. And then like, it, especially at Horror Nights, when you walk down the escalators, they're playing heavy metal and I'm the only one, I'm the only crazy one on the stairway, just head banging and singing along and stuff. People look at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, it's Iron Maiden, dude. Like I cannot not sing. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I know. Come on, man. Yeah, I know. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, I remember, you know, growing up and, uh, you know, the second sort of half of my childhood in Southern California, I grew up in Buena Park and I was right. literally across the street from North Ferry Farm. Okay. And I could, I remember, um, you know, during the, the, you know, the Halloween haunt, I could hear people screaming <laughs> and I can hear people laughing. I can hear people having fun. And that was always something that like, would pump me up so much to like right. the, the, the day that I got to go and I would just sit there and listen <laughs> to them. Oh man, that was a good one. You know? Yeah. It was crazy. But you know, when I was a kid, I'm like, that's so awesome. Like what's happening, you know? Yeah. And it was so cool to be so, um, so close, you know? Yeah. No, I'm the same. I'm the same. Just about like 10, 15 minutes away from it. So I can take the, sh the streets all the way up. I'm in Norwalk. So, um, oh, cool. yeah, yeah. I'm right up the street, but uh, no, I, I, I absolutely love uh, mixing the world of music with horror um, because it, 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 there's so much great music out there that just when you put it on, you're like, this, this, this just fits, you know, it just it just makes sense. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. Well, because I, to me, uh, horror uh, predominantly more than at least the horror that I enjoy is right. less about and this might seem counterintuitive is a little bit less about jump scare and a little more about atmosphere. Right. Um, and I like that, like, kind of existential terror that you get from just, a, like, an oppressive or very dark or very, you know, unsettling atmosphere. Right. And I think that that can really tie in with music really well. You know, like, you know, stuff I listen to, I don't listen to too much metal, but things that are a little more instrumental, more avant-garde, noise-based, yeah. kind of weird things, maybe some early electronic music or things like that, that have that sense of foreboding or, you know, they yeah. build that atmosphere. And that is... Um, that, yeah, I mean, it goes. You ever try to watch a movie without music? It's right, you weird. know what? I tell that you know I, mean? I tell that to people so, all the time. I'm like, give me a movie <laughs> without music, and I guarantee you, it's not going to be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. unless it's like you know, like uh, you know, two guys just the whole movie's two guys talking in a diner or something. I mean, really, the music is the heartbeat of of of, of any kind of you know event like that or movie yeah. on a house or what what have you. Yeah, um, one of my favorite uh, horror movies that that executes music and, and score and whatnot into it and, and just has that overall like punk vibe is is the lost boys um mm. that that film just really gives that you know all the vampires are pretty much like they look like punk rockers and whatnot and you yeah. know and and just the, just the music behind it though it just really sets the tone for the film as far as leading up to the big reveal um sure and, sure and it, oh, you know a great one yeah i love the lost boys uh another one of my favorite films uh, of all time, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Um, just you know, it's funny that movie has had such a huge resurgence of of fans. Yeah, it's crazy man. Like you yeah. know, because when I was younger, it was definitely like this B movie that people enjoyed and things like that. But it's got it's real. Like it's almost more popular now than it was ever really that, at that right. point. It's, it's cool and stuff. I love things that like that. You know, yeah, I mean, it's just, man. It's, gotta get to, it's gotta ripen like you know like a wine you know yeah i mean you you listen obviously the title track written by the dickies um and sure. just a fun track to listen to i mean i i play it all the time but john masari's uh score for that film is like it's just it, it really it pretty much puts you into that film just listening to it and just kind of it, you, it gives you the the whole circus and clown vibes to it you know what i mean and the march yeah. and and just like the different like you know sounds that they make in the in the film it just it really immerses you into that film and it makes you feel part of that 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 world which i loved and then yeah finally getting to go through that at halloween horror nights it was just like oh putting that music seeing the scenes seeing the clowns like i was in love like <laughs> since yeah. i was a kid i've always wanted to enter that <laughs> ship and i finally got to do it you know that's awesome yeah. that's awesome 
I, I really like, um, as far as like music and film, um, yeah, if we're going to go the Lost Boys way, but Return of the Living Dead and that soundtrack, yes. that has some really awesome, like the Cramps and 45 Grids, and those, those are like bands that I really, I mean, I love, you know, I still right. do to this day, you know, and things like that, kind of this horror and mixing of horror and punk and things like that was was very attractive to me, especially when I was younger. Right. Um, but I really, really love, uh, you know, Italian uh, film like Argento movies and things like that and right. I love the 70s kind of horror especially the, the 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 giallo horror you know genre because I love that just I love like Goblin you know the band Goblin I love yeah. that sound man I just like you know it, it's just great it's just driving it's it's stylistic it's it's cool music and with, mixed with Argento visuals. I mean, it's something that's really cool. Yeah. And I love the, like, Suspiria, I love the, I don't know if you've seen the, the original Suspiria, but the, the remake, I actually, I really liked the film. Right. But I did, was disappointed with the music, you know, um, which I think Tom York did the music for it from Radiohead. But it just doesn't have that, the, 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 the presence of Goblin and it was such a right. heavily pre they're so present in the film yeah that um that was a little disappointment with the remake but um those would be my favorite in terms yeah. of like horror films and music and John Carpenter that, that Carpenter, kind of yeah. you know those kind of uh instrumental interludes and things like that those are yeah. things that I really love because you know the, the music I normally listen to is more in in the that realm you know right yeah, yeah. Uh, Carpenter, I mean, he is, I mean, talk about a jack of all trades right there, man. The guy produces, writes, directs, scores, you know. I mean, one of my favorite movies, obviously The Thing is one of my favorites, but another one of my favorites is uh, They Live. And I just love hearing that score oh, yeah. throughout the whole film, you know what I mean? And uh, that's just a, it's such a good film, man, and it's one of my favorites. So yeah, just, no, I, yeah, the, yeah, John Carpenter was a really, really big influence for me um, in terms of The Thing mainly i mean was a great you know that was the thing and probably like i think most people my age that do this cut line of work i think the thing american werewolf in london um, these are the movies that really yeah like burst i think a whole generation of effects artists like maybe the previous generation was dick smith and the exorcist and right. thousand year old man these kind of things were um that birth that generation my generation you know kids of the 80s it's like I mean, it didn't get much better than that, you know. Yeah. I love that. I mean, it's just you know, you're you're introducing the world of slashers in the '80s. You know what I mean? And you had, you know, uh, it, it all really started. If you want to go far back, uh, I always consider him one of my favorite, uh, one of the OG slashers. Even though he uses a chainsaw, is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which came out what was it seventy sure. was it seventy four seventy. Something like that. Yeah, yeah around was, there. 74, 74 probably. Yeah, and um, then, you know, you fast forward a little bit to 70, 77, 78 for Halloween. And that's when it spawned a whole new generation of, you know, Freddy, Jason, yeah. all that stuff. So it, it started just taking never, off there. I love, um, I'm a huge Tom Savini fan, so I, oh. I definitely love, you know, Savini's work. I mean, that's essentially how I learned how to do a lot of things because, you know, Savini put out these really cool books. Um, I believe they're called like Grand Illusion, something like that. But, I always call him the, I mean, uh, these were, the sex machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that guy looks great though, man. Like that guy's yeah. in his seventies. I mean, look him up now. Yeah. I mean, he's like jacked. I mean, he's probably full of steroids or whatever, but I mean, he looks great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's insane. I'm like, God, you're 70s. Man. But, um, but his books were really big, uh, you know, in terms of like, trying to figure out how to how to do some of this stuff right but i was never was a really super huge fan of the slasher films i definitely love texas chainsaw massacre yeah um because i think that's just a genius movie like the, the especially the original um in terms of like direction because you know uh there really is not much there's i don't think there's really any gore and hardly any blood in it but yeah. in your head you think like man this is like one of the goriest most sick movies you've ever seen yeah and it's not because when you watch it, you're like, you know, when something happens, they actually cut away. It's an off-screen thing, yeah. yeah. So it's an off-screen thing, and I find that to be, you know, it's again, it sounds counterintuitive to, for what I do, but I find that that's a very, um, a very uh, effective technique for me because I think your own mind is a lot more uh, will think of something a lot scarier than whatever anybody else can show you yeah you know no then that was uh, you know talking about you know stuff like that another one that really 
uses music to an advantage because this the disaster they had on set making it was Jaws. You know what I mean? When you when you look mm, at Jaws, yeah. you don't see the shark a lot. You know, you see you hear the music, knowing that that is the shark, giving the illusion of the shark. But because of so much, you know, flaws and whatnot that they had making that film, you know, you see the shark for like a total of like five, ten minutes in that film. Mm-hmm. Um, Alien as well. Alien, Alien as well. Good yeah. Example of that. Uh, and I love that because I, I like personally, I like slow burns. Again, I love atmosphere. Yeah. I love that impending sense of doom, you know, because that is scary. I mean, that, and that sustains you throughout an entire film. Right. You know, jump scare. You will like, and, and this goes for haunted houses as well. I think, like, you know, you keep doing, you you will notice the best haunted houses avoid this, but jump scare after jump scare after jump scare after jump scare because your mind just gets kind of gets desensitized to it. Right. You know, you're like, okay, jump scare, another one, another one. But when you have that overarching sense of impending doom, that's a much more lasting effect. And I think it's much more effective of creating horror, you know. Yeah. Same thing with the first Halloween, because the first Halloween, yeah, it's like that as well. It's a lot more about atmosphere and, and, um, you know, then, then, uh, just, yeah, just no, the, definitely uh, the blood and guts aspect um, of it. Because it does, yeah, so. it's the same thing. You, you know, you, you look at Michael Myers today and you're thinking like, Oh, this guy's a freaking gory killer. I mean, the new ones you see him, he, I mean, they have, obviously they have the, the money and stuff now to do it. But like when they made that first one, mm. it was considered a B film. You know what I mean? It wasn't supposed to be as big mm. as it was and it, and it blew up. Yeah. Uh, so they were working on a very tight budget, you know, the, I think their, you know, their most well-known actor at the time was uh, Donald Pleasance, you know, and and yeah, and he, and even then, I mean, yeah. at that point, you know, in, in his career, but I, I think, um, well, I mean, it's just so effective and it's so simple. Yeah, doesn't overthink anything, doesn't try to do too much. I mean, there's still that scene, you know, when Jamie Lee Curtis is looking out the window, and you just see, because you know, I grew up with we we drew our clothes, you know, we yeah. didn't we didn't have a clothes dryer, we put it on the. Yeah. on the you know the the clothes dryer out, outside on, on on the clothesline right and just that scene where she sees like the 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 sheets and then you see them and then you don't see them i mean it's just pretty simple yeah scene but it's so effective and i i still think about it now and get it just like i don't i, I get an uneasy feeling you know yeah. because it's just so atmospheric and yeah. so tastefully done you well, know and that and that, and that, that, that movie has a couple of those scenes you know life. it's it's like it, you got the scene where she looks out from the school and then he's there and he's gone. The scene where she's walking yeah. home in the bush, he's there and he's gone. So it's like, you know, thinking, you know, it, it may not look like much, but, you know, when you start thinking about that in like a real life scenario, it's a little freaky to think about. You know what I mean? Like, it is because what the, the, the one thing that I find is like the best about horror movies, and this is because my very first love of any kind of media is the, the original Twilight Zone. I grew up oh, yes. coming home from school. You know, KTLA, Channel 5, man, you yeah. have the Twilight Zone on there. And, and, you know, when I was young, it was Thanksgiving when they had the marathon. Right. But I think the idea of, like, an unreliable narrator, like, in films, or, like, the unreliable protagonist is, right. like, something that's very appealing to me. Because that is, the protagonist, essentially, is your anchor point in the film. So when the protagonist in the film, you might be like, okay, are they really seeing this? Are they not seeing this? What's happening? Right. To me, that adds to that sense of, like impending doom because now your anchor in the film is not a steady anchor you know what i mean and so that's something that i eat up like quite a bit like one of the most scariest episodes of the twilight zone is an episode called the dummy you know with a ventriloquist yes one of my favorites and you just don't know like is this guy a drunk and like psychotic or is this thing for real man because like i don't know and it's just like you it put you 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 get you can so quickly become in that person's headspace, you know, and like, you know, there's little scenes where the, the, the ventriloquist doll is looking this way, you know, if he had, the actor has dialogue, he looks over here and then when he comes back in the mirror, you can see like the head is just shifted a little bit like this yes. in the background, just in the background, you know, they don't bring any attention to it, it's just boom in the background. And it's like that enough, even thinking of today, like makes me feel weird in my stomach, well, you know, cause it's just so, you know, effective. you're talking about Twilight Zone episodes. Obviously, uh, one of them that that leaves you with suspense the entire thing until the very end of the episode was uh, "Beauty is in the eye of the beholder," with no, you know sure. the pig face people. But you don't find that out to the oh, end. Yeah. Like you, you, you know, you, all you hear is, you know, you've been in a terrible accident and we had to reconstruct your face, and and so you're thinking, oh, her, she must be messed up. Like you know, the entire episode, like because it's all black. You don't see any characters. You know, you only see the the bodies, the what they're wearing, but you don't see their faces. And then at the end, like she's like, "Oh, we gotta, we, we're gonna put you here with someone else that's just like you and stuff, so you won't be alone." And you find out them two are normal, but the whole world is all like pig face people, and you're just like, 
what the hell is going on? Like, no, I was thinking the complete the opposite. Class, it's a classic episode that's really stood the test of time. And, and that's a good example of, like, another technique I think that's really effective is the idea of, like, subverting expectation. Yeah. And, um, you know, people use that a lot. These Like, I remember I was a huge Game of Thrones. I am a huge Game of Thrones fan. Oh, I read Game all the Thrones books is... and everything like yeah. that. And But, but the, the last season was so horrible. And the, the, <laughs> the, the, the two guys that, you know, really um, – uh, you know, put, put the producers that put it all together, like, oh, well, we just want to subvert expectation, you know, which it's like, that's like the, the bad way to do it, which yeah. is basically, it's just a like, hey, gotcha for no yeah. reason. But like something that stands the test of time, like Eye of the Beholder is a great example of that technique because what it does is now you're, you're are all ramped up for to see like, God, how ugly is this lady? Yeah. Like, this is going to be nuts, dude. When they take this yeah. bandage off, it's going to be crazy. Then they take the bandage off. You're like, whoa, now you have to reassess everything. Yeah. And you have to think like, what's what? And so now you're in a headspace to where, you know, Rod Serling was a brilliant, you know, my hero really yes. was a, such a brilliant person to realize of putting people in order to get certain messages across, you have to put people in certain headspaces. You can't just tell them like something. You can't just preach to them right. because they're going to have all their preconceived notions and all these stuff, biases and things. But if you can get somebody in a headspace using suspension of disbelief, subverting expectation, all these different types of things, it's a lot easier to get through um, to people. And it's, it makes something that stands the test of time, which is why yeah. as I would argue you can watch an, anybody generation can watch an episode and still um, oh yeah, enjoy no, it. I, I even think to this day, uh, I was fortunate enough to have a really cool uh, English teacher in high school, my freshman year. And uh, like on days when we would be caught up or something, or like if we, you know, he was filling it, we would watch. He would show us episodes of The Twilight Zone, and that's when I first really got into. Like I always knew what The Twilight Zone was, I just never actually seen it. And so when I finally got to actually watch a few episodes, that that I had to be uh, the Beholder and the Dummy one uh, was yeah. two that I remember watching and. I just remember falling in love with the show that, like, the very, like, next day, I remember it, it being on Netflix, and I just binge-watched the entire series just because I couldn't yeah. stay off of it. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, it just, it, it's it's so simple. Some of the things are so simple. Some of the episodes only have two characters. Those are the ones that really, one character. I mean, the pilot, think about how ballsy this is, too. Yeah. I mean, the pilot episode is an episode called Where's Everybody with Earl Holloman, who does, like, one of the best, still a performance that I think is, like, one of the best in, like, TV history. Right. Taking like he's starting a pilot episode of a series where he is the only apart from like a, 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 a you know several minute epilogue of the thing you see the entire show yeah just him you know what yeah. i mean like running around an empty studio lot like a universal lot you right. know and it's like that's nuts man but yet it's still like what you know it's still very captivating and yeah it's, it's, it's really now, cool and what they did was so little was it twilight zone or was it hitchcock's show I forget which one. There was an episode where it was about mannequins in a mall, and one of them got to that come to Twilight life. Zone. That was Twilight Zone, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I used to watch Hitchcock the Hour After too. Hours. Yeah. Yeah, I, sure. I used to watch the Hitchcock um, that one too. That was an episode yeah. called um, The After Hours, and that's a really cool episode yeah. too. You know about a mannequin that comes to life. They have their floor that they're on, and yeah. she goes out shopping, and then comes back up, and then has that sort of self-realization moment that you know she's a mannequin. They take I think turns. You forget. Yeah. They take turns, essentially, yeah, yeah. you know, and that that sort of that is an intro. That is a really cool episode, you know. I mean, there's a you can. I mean, I've been thinking about the Twilight Zone my entire life, you know what I mean? And yeah. I, every time I watch it, I I have a different conclusion. And some episodes that I didn't like, um, you know, when I was a kid, I I mean, those are some of my favorite now. You know, it just, right. just kind of, you know, you you grow with the show, and it's it's, it's still my favorite show, TV even show of all time. Even the movie they did. Back in like the the seventies eighties, uh, the Twilight Zone, the mm -hmm. movie, um, one of my favorites too. They reimagined a lot of those stories, but they still were true to the the art of the of the show. You know what I mean? So the movie uh, was cool. I, yeah. I I don't know if they like some of them were cool, great actors, great effects in some of them, and uh, yeah, you know, there's an unfortunate incident that happened. Yeah, uh, with the considered one, one of the, the actors considered a cursed but, film actually. Yeah, yeah, but but. Uh, this is a good example of like really good direction. It's like the the remake they did of um, of Nightmare at uh, Twilight Zone, Nightmare at twenty thousand feet, and then right. in the movie it's Nightmare at thirty thousand feet with Shatner and and Lithgow, John Lithgow respectively. Yeah, I think that you know people give William Shatner a lot of shit, the saying that he's not a good actor. I think William Shatner is a brilliant, like a genius. It's Captain Kirk, actor. man, and he's Captain Kirk, which yeah. I'm a huge Star Trek fan as well, but. 
I think that if you watch those two things side by side, you really see the genius in William Shatner because, you know, in the movie, Lithgow starts up here. He starts at a 10, man. Yeah. Like he's insane on the plane. I think William Shatner, it's a bit of a slow, but you're like, wait a minute, is this guy? And again, it's that faulty, uh, uh, you know, um, unreliable protagonist, you know, right. it's like, okay, this guy just had a nervous breakdown. Now he's on some kind of like meds. I'm like, is it, is he for real? You know, and yeah. the way he does it, it's like, you don't know, you know? And so like, cause really the movie is about a gremlin on a plane. I mean, yeah. it's like, just dumb. In a way, it's kind of dumb. You know what I mean? You're like, right. who cares about this gremlin? It's not really about the gremlin. It's about the slow descent into madness. Yeah. You know? And, um, you know, that is a good example of how really don't make movies like they used to really oh, saying that yeah, phrase. Man. Or being I conservative. That. But in a way, it's like, you know, and, and it's not to say they don't do that. Actually, now I think people take a lot more risk because there's a lot more, you know, platforms for movies to be on and things like that. But, right. you know, I mean, that's a good example. It's like, sometimes you don't always have to be over the top and everything. You just have to let things kind of simmer, you know? And I think that that creates something a lot cooler. Right. No, I, I, yeah, I, I love all that stuff, man. And it just, you know, growing up, another one of my favorite, you know, anthology things that they did were also two of them, which, uh, creep show and tales from the crypt. Um, Oh, sure. Yeah, obviously, you know, uh, you got to love the, the puppeteering between both of those characters, you know, and, and just, just seeing that come to life is really cool. There was, a, there was a show in the 80s when I was a kid called Tales from the Dark Side, okay. which was an interesting anthology show. I hadn't watched it since I was a kid, and then I just recently like tried to rewatch it. You know, right. It wasn't any good. But I do remember the intros to it just terrifying me when it came on, just like, you know, the music. Right, and it was like a the intro was just basically just like footage of like you're uh, driving down like a wooded you know like a heavily wooded road. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, like the color goes to like negative, and for what re- I don't know why, but like when I was a kid, that terrified me. Right. You know? and I was like, God. And so I tried to watch it again, and I'm like, oh, I wonder if it still has that same level of dread. And I was like, Oh my God, this is so easy. <laughs> like it didn't like. You know, like the Twilight Zone, for one reason or another, it still kind of, kind of moved me. Like that one was like, oh my God, this is, <laughs> right? I can't get into this. Yeah. You know what's funny is- uh, Tales from the Crypt was great. Yeah, Tales from the Crypt is, is one of my favorite. I love the Crypt Keeper. I love uh, Creep Show. Um, that host mm-hmm. as well. It's great. Um, again, uh, another one of my favorites. Uh, what's his name? From The Walking Dead, the guy who, who also produces that show too. Um, I forget his name. Uh, it'll probably come back to me, but the anyway, author of the Kirkman, yes. yeah, Robert Kirkman. No, no, no. Yeah, uh, Creep Show was Stephen King. Mm-hmm. Um, and Walking Dead was Kirkman, right? And then Kirkman. Creep Show was Stephen. Was, the the uh, uh, the producer who did it though, uh, Greg Nicotero. Oh, oh Greg Nicotero. Sure, yeah, sure. he's the guy that. No, that, he's a great another yeah. great effects artist. You know, yeah. I mean that that guy. Yeah. Definitely okay. had a good, and he seems to be really supportive and um, really cool. And there's a lot in the, in the Walking Dead. I, I don't really watch. I don't really watch too much of the Walking Dead. In all right. honesty, I'll watch like scenes and frames for reference to make cool stuff, you know. Yeah. But I um, there's a lot of Easter eggs in there, you know. Especially as a, as as um, as you know, the seasons will roll on, you know, like effects artists, you know, will make like kind of homages, of, yeah. you know, zombies that are of different things. I know one of my favorite uh, effects artists that works in the film industry is this guy, Norman Cabrera. And Norman Cabrera did a zombie that was based off one of my favorite, like old, you know, vintage masks, which is a shock monster, which was, um, you know, really cool, iconic image. If I showed you the image, you would know what it is, but he made right. like his modern updated zombie as that. So those That's little so things cool. like that, those are really cool to see. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, I, I am an absolute fan. It, uh, before I lose this one though, cause there was something I want to tell you about Twilight Zone. One of my, one of my buddies actually, uh, we, we did this like little thing for the channel where we just designed mazes for future properties. We'd love to see at like HHN knots or something. Oh, he actually, he actually designed a full on like black and white version of the Twilight Zone. Um, where the whole mm. maze from start to finish would be in black and white. You'd be, like, immersed into that world. Uh, and the concepts for it just sounded so bitching. It's just a matter of finding the right stories of what you wanted to do. But, man, imagine, imagine for one, you getting a gig for making props for that, like, all black and white, that kind of style of, like, the Twilight Zone, bringing that to life. That'd be really cool, man. That would be cool. You know, I've, you know, I've thought of that, as, you know, many times yeah. over the years of, <laughs> of how could that be you know 
it's tough because I don't know if you could capture that in a haunted house because it's just really you're ingesting two different you're ingesting the medium two different ways. You know, right. if you did, it would have to be something more akin to like, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever gone to the event Delusion. Um, I've heard of California. it, but I've never been Delusion. to it. Yeah, Delusion is one of the best one of the best you know haunted attractions or you know Halloween events I've ever been to. But right. in that in in that way, I think you can do a Twilight Zone really well because it's more of like an interactive theatrical experience. You know right. what I mean? So you have time to kind of ruminate on certain things or you can go a little left field. Whereas in a haunted house, there is a, there's that balance of, of up and down, you know, like it's, so it's more like a haunted house really is more like a song. Yeah. It's really, you got to say it in five minutes, you know, however long it's a short period of time yeah. and you have to have a lot of ebb and flow up and down constantly to remain engaged as you're walking through. And, um, I don't know. It's, it might be a little harder for like a, something that could be slow burn, like a Twilight Zone. I don't know, but I would yeah. be super excited. But I interject that stuff all the time. Like I, you know, helped create this character at, when I was working at another company called Ghost Ride Productions, which is one probably the premier prop company in the in the haunted house business. Right. And uh, we did like you know everybody everybody does clown. You have to have some kind of clown yeah. element, you know, that you're gonna offering for people. Yeah, but yeah. I'm like, well, how can I make it cool? And so uh, my my thinking for the whole aesthetic of the clown was uh, from a Twilight Zone episode called Five Characters in Search of an Exit, okay. which is – talk about simplicity. I mean the set really is just a rounded wall, you know, gray, you yeah. know, and that and has these five people in it, a clown, a soldier, a ballerina, you know, these types of things. And they were trying to figure out why are we in this room, number one, we just woke up here, right. and how do we get out, you know? Yeah. And a really, cool, really great episode. But, uh, you know, we did the, the costume exactly like the clown in, in that episode and and other little um, little Easter eggs, I guess, on the character. Yeah, no, I I uh, I, I, I did. I, it's fun. It's it's finally fun to talk to someone who's like, you know, you, it's rare that I get a lot of people that are on like a, a level of passionate love for this stuff, man. And, and it's just fun to just dive deep into this world. I really like doing it. I mean, you could tell my excitement. Well, here. for better, for better, or for worse, man. It's like, you know, I, I definitely, I couldn't do any, I couldn't do anything with my life that I'm not passionate about. Yeah. And that's sometimes a scary proposition because, you know, I mean, think about like the world, most people don't do, you know, I've been very blessed and I feel very privileged to be able to, you know, make a living doing this. Right. But um, it's, it's rare. And it's like, I just, you know, for better, like I say, for better, or for worse, that's just, the way I am as a person, you know, right. it's like, I just not can't, you know, I yeah. can't just punch in and out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's just not me. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, you probably can't answer this if it's, if, if there is anything, but can we expect to see your work in any SoCal haunts this year? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And there, yeah, there is some really cool, like there's one project uh, in SoCal that I'm super excited about. I, I can't mention it now, but yeah. it is really, it's going to be awesome and um, and super excited about that. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could probably still see some of my stuff, you know, done over the years, done lots of stuff for not, right. uh, not Scary Farm, for the Universal properties, for, um, you know, stuff that, you know, John Cook, who I'm sure, you know, worked at Knott's Berry Farm, now works with 34 Entertainment, yeah. is a good friend of mine. And like, you know, so I've done a lot of stuff with him and those events. And before I, I started this company, I was working with uh, 134 Entertainment, which has the LA Haunted Hayride there. Right. So I did a lot of, at that time, did a lot of props for that. And um, for last year's event, which we did a drive-in type experience. <laughs> and then the year before, which is the more traditional yeah. uh, hayride. So we did some... Like if you if you went to the event the, the driving event this year, I made uh, all the masks that oh, were really? the actors were wearing. Um, wow, those were produced by me, sculpted by a really one of my favorite sculptors in the business, uh, this guy Mikey Rotella, okay, who uh, has done a lot of stuff, you know, in the film business, but yeah. also done a lot of Halloween work with a company that was really big, uh, inspirational for me. Uh, a company called Distortions Unlimited, and one of the really sort of legend companies of the Halloween business. Um, so that was cool. Like there's like a giant, you know, 11 foot fish hanging off the end of a boat. I made that. All these little things here and there, you know. So Dude, hats off to you because that oh, yeah, event was definitely. one of my favorites last year. 
Oh, really? Cool. Yeah. Man. Well, that was a really, you know, we didn't know what we were going to do and putting it all together was very kind of hectic and you didn't know how are going to people like this or are they not going to like it? You yeah. know, but I think ultimately, you know, it took us maybe like a week or two to really get in the swing of things. But um, when we did, it, it was a super fun show. It was just, it, it was really cool. You know, Monty Revolta did a great <sighs> job, I think, as, you know, the host, which I, yeah. I love that guy. He's a fan of his. And um, that guy really was there every night, um, you know, scaring people every single night. Yeah. I mean, what, he's, a, he's a really professional guy, man, when you think about it. I mean, yeah, but I yeah. love him and I love that there was a, we have this, you know, we were able with John uh, taking over sort of the art direction or the, the sort of the creative direction of Hey Ride, I think it was really cool because I love icon characters, these characters that sort of go from season to season, you know, right. and you can see their evolution and stuff. So I think having Monty as that um, icon character for the Hayride is really cool. You know, yeah, it's really dude. Fun. You throw Monty it's in anything, I'll, I'll show up because the guy makes yeah. me die, man. He's he's hilarious. Oh, he's great. He's actually really good at what he does. You know, I, I the, the first thing I saw him do, and I think probably was the first thing John saw him do, but it was at this convention. It was a great convention in Pasadena called Monster Palooza. Right. And um, he was doing, there was like a party that was like a celebration of the work of Rick Baker. And so he did, um, you know, and it was hosted by Monty Revolta. And right. I, I, know Monty, I didn't know who Monty Revolta was. I'm like, oh, no, this is going to be some comedy horror thing. <laughs> it's going to be so cringe, dude. You know what I mean? It's like you have a low, really low expectation. Yeah. So when I saw him, I was like, man, this guy, I mean, he's, his patter is great. You know, he's good at, at um yeah, ad limbing and things like that, and and he did a great job. So when we got him at the hayride, I was super stoked on that. Yeah, um, the, the I think that I think the ultimate duo I would love to see one day, if the universes ever cross over, uh, the captain from Dark Harbor and, and Monty Revolta, man, that'd be an amazing oh. duo right there. I mean, I, gotta say, I think Monty's got it in the bag, dude. Like, I think so too. Put them against each other, it's like. But imagine know. them working yeah. together, man. Like the insults that I sure. think I think it'd be a matter of one upping each other because those two have you know their egos are just there. But it's it'd be a great time yeah. for the guests. That's true. That's very true. Yeah. But if I'm putting money down, it's going on Monty. Oh man, I mean, Monty is. <laughs> don't get me wrong, Monty is great. But I have a love for the captain too, man. I I'm split in the middle on this one. I really am. I really am, man. Oh man. Well, uh, Mike. It has been an absolute pleasure getting to talk to you, uh, learn more about you, and and just your love for horror, man. And 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 thank you for taking the time out of your day to do this for us, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. Yeah, um, you know, thanks for having me on. It's great. I'm always always able to talk about movies and stuff and nerd out on things. So yeah. So uh, thanks for having me. And if you want to check out some of my work, you can on Instagram. It's probably the best place to do it. It's just at rib r i b dot effects. Yep. And that's, you know, stuff I'm working on. Like I said, it's been, a, it's a bit of a slower start for me this year, but next year we're getting in full swing. We have a yeah. full booth at the trade show. And so I'll be updating regularly and just gonna kind of see what I'm working on. Awesome, man. I mean, you know, uh, you got a platform to help promote anytime you need it, man. Um, we are here to support, man. I mean, we love the work that you, you do. I, I got to, you know, before doing this podcast, I checked out the Instagram page, a lot of great, like I said, even the stuff you see on the screen right now. I mean, a lot of great work, and, and I can't wait to see more of it at the haunts and wherever oh, I'm thanks, at, man. man. So, uh, oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, brother. So uh, go go hit up uh, rib.fx on Instagram. Uh, check them out. You won't regret it. It's uh, a lot of great work and uh, continues to do great work. So can't wait to see what's next for you, man. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate it. With all that being said, if you guys are new to the channel, hit that subscribe button with that bell notification to be aware every time we put up a new video. Uh, follow us on Instagram at the Knights of Horror and on Twitter at Knights of Horror. And uh, until then, I'm your host, Anthony, from the Knights of Horror, and we'll see you guys next week. You're moving into a